Good morning and welcome to the Keep Louisiana Beautiful State Conference. My name is Susan Russell and I'm the Executive Director for Keep Louisiana Beautiful. I am thrilled today to have as our presenter, Rob Taylor with the Recycling Partnership Organization. He will be presenting today on their 2020 State of Curbside Recycling Report. As a leading national force for improving recycling, the Recycling Partnership puts private dollars to work in communities because they know that when they invest in a system to protect resources, empower sustainable action and unlock opportunities that everyone wins. In this se session, we are going to explore how well the system is doing in maximizing recovery of residential curbside materials. We're going to look at best management practices to reduce contamination. And at the end of this presentation, you're going to have a greater understanding of what it takes to have a healthy curbside recycling program in your community. The Recycling Partnership is currently in Louisiana working with the Lafayette Consolidated Government. Just this past Monday, they kicked off a program called Feet on the Street, and they are uh, educating residents on the do's and don'ts of uh, recycling curbside to reduce contamination, what's accepted, what's not accepted with the goal of reducing those contamination rates. And so we're gonna learn a little bit more about what they're doing already here in Louisiana and some opportunities for other communities in Louisiana to engage in those efforts. So before we move further, we're going to throw up a couple of poll questions. I wanna get an understanding from everyone today um, where, where we are. So please take a second and punch in your answer. Do you have curbside recycling in your city? Yes or no? And if you do, do you participate? So we know that we have participants today from all over the state of Louisiana, some from our state agencies, some from our parishes, others from local municipalities. Some are representing our affiliate network, some nonprofits, um, and some individuals who just um, really want to, to uh, promote uh, a healthier recycling program in Louisiana. So this information will be very useful to us. So moving forward, let me go with, on with a couple of housekeeping notes for today. So I want to remind everyone that uh, our attendees are all muted and your camera is off and it will be for the duration of the presentation. But we do wanna make this interactive. So we encourage you to submit questions in the question and answer box below. We will be monitoring that and we will um, be asking Rob questions throughout the presentation. You can also chat and that is in the chat box and Cabal Mouton is behind the scenes and she'll be monitoring the chat box. So we do just ask that all of the questions in the chats that they stay relevant to the topic that we're talking about today. We also wanna let you know that these sessions are being recorded and after they are completed, they will be posted on our website in early December. So please check back and share this information with your colleagues and with your friends and family. And lastly, this is the fifth of a six part learning series. The last one will be held on November 24th at the same time, starting at nine o'clock. And we'll be looking at um, litter enforcement strategies. We'll have folks from the state police as well as the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. We'll be looking at campaigns and how to use cameras to help with your enforcement. So please join us. Uh, and again, it is free and um, registration will stay open until the morning of. So share the information. People can go to our website and click on the link. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So um, I don't have the results of the poll yet, but as soon as we do, we will share that with you. Um, but now let's bring on Rob. So Rob Taylor is the Director of Grants and Community Development with the Recycling Partnership. His career spans 20 years working in recycling on both a state and a local level. For 
um, for so many years, he worked with the North Carolina Department of, of Environmental Quality, overseeing the state recycling programs and supporting local initiatives. Before that, he worked for the North Carolina um, Orange County, where he managed their recycling programs in his community for 140,000 residents. His passion is always been with recycling and we are just thrilled to have him joining us today um, to, to enlighten us and, and to, to share with us what works and what doesn't so that we can have a healthier um, recycling program in Louisiana. So Rob, I'm gonna let you just take it away. Rob? Hello, Susan, and hello, everybody. Yeah. Um, waiting for my video to start up. Hi, hi everyone. Um, it's so exciting to be here with you today. Thank you very much, Susan, for that introduction and for asking me to be a part of your virtual conference this year. It was my privilege to be at your state conference and um, speak in 2018, and I only wish that I could be there uh, in person today. So thank you all so very much. Um, looking forward to uh, the next spending the next hour with you or so talking about curbside recycling in the United States. Waiting for my presentation to get pulled up here yet. So the Recycling Partnership is a national nonprofit organization. We're working across the country to advance recycling. And we do that by working directly with local governments, um, providing technical assistance and grant funding. And I'll tell you a little bit more about our work as we move on. Uh, next slide, please. We do that work with the support of our funders who make everything possible that the Recycling Partnership does. Um, this is over 50 companies and organizations that um, are all stakeholders in the success of recycling in the United States whether they're brand owners or uh, whether they're retailers or whether the companies that make or recycle the packaging, they all depend on community recycling programs to, uh, and citizens across the country to uh, make recycling work. Next slide, please. So the Recycling Partnership um, understands that recycling in the United States is a system. It's a system that's loosely connected yet completely interdependent. This slide it identifies some of the actors in the recycling system in our country, whether it's consumers, communities, entities that pick up recycling haulers, whether it's a local government running collections or a private company doing collections, the MRF, the processor who receives materials from the MRF, the manufacturer who demands the recyclables to make new products as a feedstock, or the brand owners and the retailers who are um, producing the packaging. Louisiana is an important part of that system. And hopefully by the time we're done talking today, you'll see more about how the system is stitched together. Uh, the Recycling Partnership engages in on all levels in the system when the hope that it, it, and we understand that it, we're gonna have to work together to advance that system. Next slide. So here's what we're gonna be talking about today. I'm gonna be telling you about the Recycling Partnership's State of Curbside Report. We're gonna talk about materials generation so that you get a sense of how much recyclables are out there. We're gonna really dig deep on curbside recycling. We're gonna talk about access to recycling across the country. We're gonna talk about how recycling programs can be effective and what they can do to improve their performance. We're gonna share some best management practices we're gonna spend some time talking about the best, um, how to take on contamination, identify the challenges associated with contamination and the solutions. And then I'm gonna close by um, sharing some resources that the Recycling Partnership makes available for everybody at no cost to help you advance recycling in your community. Next slide. So in uh, earlier this year, we produced the, we published the, our 2020 State of Curbside Recycling Report. And this actually was a, an updated report. We, re, we published our first State of Curbside Report in 2016. Um, both of these reports are available on our website. And what they do 
is they look at the um, they look at the curbside recycling system in the United States. And we think about this system, even though it's made of a lot of independent actors, as a giant system, just like you would a, the healthcare system, for instance. And we understand that it's really important to assess how that system is performing and identify its strengths and weaknesses in order to advance it. This is the URL that you see at the bottom of the slide here for you to uh, find this report yourself and read it. And um, you can also just Google State of Curbside Report Recycling Partnership and you'll uh, hopefully find a link to download. Next slide. So I wanna start by sharing like the top five perspectives that we gleaned at the recycling system. Um, we gleaned about the US recycling system today in 2020 as a part of preparing for this report. And what we know is that curbside recycling and the recycling system in the US is stressed right now. And I don't intend you to read the individual details here, but these are the, like the take home messages from the state of curbside report. And I'll just really tick them off uh, very quickly. The first thing to know is that there are a lot of recyclables ending up in the trash in the United States. The second thing to understand is that just more than half of the citizens in the country have access to um, recycling. At, at, they can recycle as easily as they can throw something away. And so without the access, without convenient access, um, then folks are gonna have a harder time recycling than they are discarding. Then the next point is that recycling is a service and that service costs money and it needs to be resourced to work well. Uh, and in addition, the fourth point is that contamination is, is uh, contributing to increasing the cost of running this system. It, contamination uh, is helping, is making the system more stressed and working to control contamination is gonna help ease that stress. And then finally, the last big point is that local governments lead, they're the tip of the spear when it comes to providing recycling access to uh, citizens across the country. And that uh, the truth is that local governments have so many demands placed on them and it's hard for them to mobilize the resources to make recycling work well and that it's going to take a coordinated effort from all of those stakeholders in the system that I did identified earlier to really make the recycling system work right. And the recycling partnership is working hard to pull the, all the um, stakeholders in the system together to invest and make it more effective. So let's dig in. So I'm going to start by talking to you about recyclable materials generation. And when I'm talking about recyclable materials generation, I'm really focusing on what I call traditional recyclables, cans and bottles and paper that are moving through residents across the country. There, yes, there are other recyclables, construction and demolition materials, electronics, uh, batteries, and other things, but the Recycling Partnership focuses its work on traditional recyclables from households across the country. Let's explore this a little further. Next slide. So, Thinking about households, and every one of you on this, uh, on this webinar today is in a household, think about what a single family household generates when it comes to recyclables. And what I'm talking about are materials that come in the front door. They come in the front door from the grocery store, they come in the front door from the mailbox, from deliveries that you receive from Amazon or other e-commerce. And then when you're done with them, they go out the back door and where do they go? They go into the garbage and they go into the recycling bin. What kind of materials are we talking about? You'll get a sense of the generation rates. This chart shows you how much we make and the largest type of material that moves through our home is mixed paper. Then the next largest is glass containers, corrugated cardboard. Basically, this gives you a sense of how the materials break down. And if you add this all up, uh, on average in the US, the um, next slide will tell you how much we found people are generating. So through the Recycling Partnerships work, we've identified that the average household in the US generates 760 pounds of these materials in a year. These uh, 
that's coming in the front door and out the back. So and a perfect recycling system would capture all 768 of those panels. Next slide. So let's look at that by material. This chart shows you the annual generation of the individual materials uh, and the, the percent that you could see from the previous slide. So listing those materials, you see the average home is generating just more than 100 pounds of cardboard per year, just more than 300 pounds of mixed paper, uh, six pounds of PET, uh, sorry, six pounds of aseptic containers, which are gable top boxes and juice boxes, 50 pounds, 51 pounds of PET bottles. You add that all up and you get 768 pounds. And that's what the recycling system in the country is responsible for managing. Next slide. So there's about 100 million households, single family households in the US, 97, 98 million households. If you take that 768 pounds per household and you multiply it by all 98 million households, you get a total of just under 38 million tons of material being generated each year. And so think about the full system in the United States, the recycling system, it's, if it's highly effective, is capturing that 37 million tons of material and returning it to the recycling economy. And that's a lot of material and local governments are largely responsible for providing access to curbside recycling and drop off recycling and uh, managing the reverse logistics of this material and delivering it to the supply chain. Rob, I have a question for you, a really just clarification for maybe some of um, our participants before we go further. These are some amazing numbers. And um, can you take just a few minutes to uh, dive a little deeper for folks, explain what is included in the mixed paper that seems really high uh, to me. And then of course the, the PET bottles, um, non-bottled PET, the uh, HDPE natural bottles and the colored bottles, just break it down a little bit further for, so people understand what that capture really is. Sure, great question, Susan. So um, cardboard, in this case, the first item on the chart is corrugated cardboard. It's the double layer boxes that folks receive packages in. And um, mixed paper is basically residential mixed paper is any other fiber product that moves through your home. So that includes newspapers, magazines, junk mail, the paperboard packaging that your cereal and crackers come in, the, the containers that 12 packs of beverages are in, um, the printed paper that you use when you uh, write a letter to someone uh, or you get a bill from your utility company. So it, that's, um, that is by far the largest stream, um, but it, interestingly, that stream has been shrinking over the last several, um, the last 10 to 15 years. You think about um, 10 years ago, many households had, uh, it was common for them to have five or six subscriptions to magazines, as well as receiving a, one or two daily newspapers, whereas now, um, newspapers are almost non-existent and most people consume that um, information through, uh, through the web. And so uh, the, 10 years ago, if I had showed you this chart, you would have seen newspapers and magazines on this chart as well because there was enough of them to measure separately. Now, effectively, those grades are not really taken into account very much by the recycling system anymore and they're lumped in to recycling uh, to call what we call largely a residential mixed paper. Um, additionally, we, you know, all this stuff together, the, the generation of it and the amount of materials that move through your home and the packaging that you buy when you go to the grocery store, it's evolving. And the recycling world calls that the evolving ton because the kinds of packages that you buy when you go to the grocery store continue to change as, pack, as packaging formats evolve. So as a quick example of that, um, nobody uh, 15 years ago bought applesauce and a bag. 
But now it's not uncommon, especially if you have children, to get applesauce in flexible packaging. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the other kinds of materials you see on the stream. PET bottles are, uh, for instance, water bottles or soda bottles. Um, Non-bottle PET are packages like clamshell. Like if you buy um, strawberries, they're in a clear package that has a hinge. That's a, we call those clamshells or a PET thermoform, like a microwave dinner that comes in a black tray. That's non-bottle PET. HDPE natural, that includes um, you know, traditional uh, milk jugs, HDPE colored bottles and jars. Those are things like um, laundry detergent. Obviously everybody understands glass containers, steel cans or like a Campbell's soup. Um, let's see, and then other plastics, um, three through sevens and the numbers are, represent the kind of resin that the package is made of. And three through seven, the, the primary plastics in the system are number ones and number twos. And the three through sevens represent basically all the other plastics put together. And that's a very small percent of what moves through our homes. Thank you. Yeah, great question. And please uh, jump in. I hope that we can continue to interact as we run through the presentation. Okay. Next slide. So if you took all of that 37 and a half, 37.4 million tons of materials that we just finished describing and um, directed all of those tons back into the recycling system, it would have an incredible benefit for our economy and our environment. So for instance, it would generate 370,000 jobs in the US. It would reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 96 million metric tons. That's the equivalent of saving 154 million barrels of oil a year and taking 20 million cars off the road. So recycling is not, it's an environmental act, but it's also an economic act. And it's not just saving space in landfills, it's saving energy. Next slide. So recyclable materials are commodities and those commodities move in a marketplace that is impacted by a lot of factors. Um, and it really, these are global marketplaces. If you took the value of all of those materials, that 37 million tons, uh, thir sorry, 37.4 million tons of materials each year and you recycled it, Based on the values from November 2019, that's more than $2.7 billion of material that's getting discarded each year. So this kind of breaks that material down, the value of all those materials down um, by commodity. And you'll see that different commodities have different per ton prices. Next, next question, please. Sorry, next slide. Um, and if you look at the value of that those 37 million tons over the last 17 years, you uh, sorry, since 2017, you'll see that the um, that value has declined over time. And that and that uh, what I want to stress is that the value of the recyclable materials are dynamic, and things happen that impact the value of those materials, like international trade, like um, energy prices, those impact the uh, overall value. Um, and the, we've seen a gradual decline since 2017. And this has added to the stress on the recycling system that I was describing. Let's look at this a little closer. Next slide. So when you think about what local governments and recycling systems handle, they handle the materials coming out of your household. And very often those materials are mixed together. And we think of this as the commingled ton, what you put in your recycling bin. And if you wanna examine the commingled ton based on the constituency of that ton and see how the value adds together to, uh, and what it means to your local government or your public recycling system, this slide helps explain that a little bit. So you add, you mix all those things together and you take their combined market value. And the data you see in this slide is from last spring. 
the combined value of a ton of material, including the residue or contamination that's in the bin with the recyclables, the combined value of that ton last spring was $27.20 for that ton. So if you were able to sell that ton, you would glean $27 for it. Well, that ton can't be sold mixed together. It has to be separated and sold individually. And that's done at a MRF. And the MRF is called a materials, re uh, materials recovery facility. It's a sorting factory that separates that material and breaks it into individual commodities. And that MRF has a processing cost. In this case, um, for this slide, we're showing that processing, processing cost as $90 a ton. So if the value of the ton is $27 and it costs $90 to process it, then in order to afford to process that ton, the community recycling system has to pay $62. And so last spring, on average across the country, public recycling programs were paying $62 to process recycling. Go ahead, Susan. So Rob, I just have um, an observation. So I think this is very interesting and, and I'm really surprised at the high percentage of glass at 17.2. And I think I'm a little surprised at the mixed paper as well. Um, and then I know if, if we combine all the, the plastics, but I still think that that is relatively low. Um, I just think of, you know, my own recycling cart, you know, what I, my household is producing. Um, and of course, we don't have, you know, the glass recycling. Um, so if you, if you take out the glass recycling, and if you take out the three to seven plastics, which here we, we don't accept, then that changes these numbers drastically, because those are your, your two biggest losses. Um, so, I don't know if it's really a question or just an observation. I know this is a national study, um, but I just, I, I'm a little surprised at the, at the numbers of, of glass and paper compared to, to plastics. And then what would this look like for those areas such as ours that do not accept the, the glass in the three through seven? Great, great questions, um, Susan. So this, what we're looking at is a composite, basically, of the national average um, commingled ton coming out of households. And it's really based, if you think, think back to a few slides ago when I was talking about what's generated, then you start to get a sense of what is in the bin. And plastics um, make up a lot of the volume of what's in our recycling stream. and um, but they, at the same time, they're light materials, which is what makes them such a powerful package um, because they're light. But uh, glass is very heavy and very dense. And uh, there are communities which see glass in their recycling system as high as a quarter of all the materials they collect if they're welcoming glass into the curbside system mix. And so again, if you think about what's generated um, by the individual household, you start to get a sense of um, what, what the commingled ton might look like across the country. And, you know, three through seven plastics, and they're it, like, if you look at uh, the packaging that's in your refrigerator, a lot of it falls into that category. But by weight, surprisingly, it's still uh, just around 1% of the, the overall packaging moving through a home. Let's, uh, let's take a look at the next slide and explore this value a little bit more deeply. So the, the, you mix all those materials together and you look at what you get is the commingled ton. And I think this slide helps illustrate the fact that recyclables are commodities. And this, is, um, this looks at the blended value of a ton of curbside recyclables over the last decade. And so you'll see that back in January of 20, um, 2010, that commingled ton was worth $50. Remember that I was just describing that in the spring, the value of the ton was about $24. If you look at how it's changed over time, um, you would see several peaks and valleys and uh, economic activity, international trade, 
energy prices, these are all factors that impact the value of the ton. And then when you start to think about processing costs, uh, hit the next slide. So imagine that if processing cost on average in the US is $70 a ton, that line represents the $70 mark, you can see that um, most of the time, the, it costs communities money to process recyclables and only a very small amount of time the, um, did the community have a net profit associated with the materials they're managing. Hit next, please. So in a very small, um, in a very small windows, communities had a net revenue associated with the recyclables they were collecting. Next. Whereas the vast majority of the time over the past decade, communities have been paying for processing. And so if you think about the budget of your public recycling system, it has to include um, funding for both the collection costs and the processing cost. And I'm hoping that this helps folks see that big picture. Next slide, please. So now I've kind of set the stage about materials and I wanna dig in on um, talking a little bit about curbside recycling. Go ahead, Susan. Rob, and you might be covering this later. So if so, then we'll just hold this question to later. But those communities that see a profit, what is it that they're doing differently than say what we're doing here in Louisiana? So, um, and I, I, great question. I wanna stress that the, the profit that I was describing was really just a positive value associated with the materials that they're collecting. So um, I'm unaware of any curbside or drop-off recycling program in the country that has a net profit. They, again, they, these are public services and they cost money to provide and what, um, when communities are making money on the materials that they're delivering to MRFs, they really just use that money to help offset the operating cost. And th there are certainly things that communities can do to maximize the, um, the effectiveness of their recycling system and decrease the cost of that recycling system. And we'll explore that a little deeply uh, in a few minutes, a little more deeply in a few minutes. Thank you. So let's dig in on uh, access and effectiveness. And I'm going to start by exploring access to curbside recycling across the country. Next slide. So if you look across the US, national survey about all the single family homes in the country and what kind of access they have to recycling. And you did that across the country, rural areas, urban areas, east coast to west coast, Canadian border to Mexican border, here's what you'd find. That 53% of the households in the country live in a place where they're provided automatic access to curbside recycling. Then another 21% of the country has access to only to a drop-off recycling system. And then there are 6% of the households in the country that have absolutely no access to recycling at all. If they wanted to save materials and drive it to a drop-off recycling site, they couldn't. So then let's talk about curbside and the different kinds of curbside recycling access. So the, the biggest category is the um, where recycling is automatically available. And that might be in a community like Jefferson Parish where there's a curbside recycling program that operates and is available to the residents who live there. Um, However, there are other kinds of curbside recycling apps that access in the country. So some communities only have subscription-based curbside recycling. And so about 6% of the households in the country have access to a subscription-based recycling system. And that of those that have access to um, subscription, a large portion of those households um, don't actually uptake that service. They could call and subscribe if they wanted to, um, but they choose not to. And I'm gonna, we're gonna explore that a little more deeply. Next slide. So let's look at participation by households in the US. So if you take those, um, you take those percents that I was just showing you, and if you add the um, curbside households with universal access, and curbside subscription access households together, 
you get just under 70 million households in the country that uh, have access to curbside recycling. And then you think about those with access, how many of those participate? We find that on average, the participation rate is 72%. And what we're doing is winnowing down the amount of materials that we're collecting. All right, so of that 72%, um, that means that we have about 50 million households that are participating in curbside recycling. And yet those, um, those that 52% who are participating, not all of those households uh, are recycling everything that they can. And we're gonna explore that again in just a second. Next slide. So remember all those materials we were talking about? We're gonna explore the capture rates for those materials. And capture rate is a concept I'm gonna get into a little further um, later in this discussion, but that's of the cardboard that goes into people's front doors, how much of that it ends up recycled. And if you look by material across capture rates, you'll see that cardboard is the most recycled material in the country, followed by HDPE natural bottles and jars, and then glass, and that the least recycled material in the country are those other plastics. Plat, um, the three through sevens. So um, different materials are treated differently by households in the country. And surprisingly, only half of the households choose to recycle their aluminum cans. Next slide. Let's explore this a little bit um, deeper as we think about the capture of materials um, and the total tons that are collected. Remember that there are 37 uh, million tons of materials generated um, in the US. And of, the, of those households that have access to recycling, that represents 19.3 million tons. So 19.3 of the 37 million tons move through households that have access to curbside recycling. And then um, the overall capture of that material, about 61% of that 19.3 million tons is captured. So that leaves us with 11 million tons, 11.9 million tons of recyclables being captured by the curbside recycling system. So uh, put that in context, that's only 32% overall of the three, three, uh, 37 million tons currently being recycled today. So that's part of why we say the curbside recycling system in the country is underperforming. Let's look at this, uh, uh, keep going a little deeper. Next slide. I think that um, it's really hard to understand how that works when you're talking about national numbers. So I decided to give you a 10 household illustration of material loss. So remember uh, the, 768 pounds per household per year. So look at a block in any city um, if you, with curbside recycling, the 10 homes on that block together are generating on average 7,680 pounds of recyclables per year. Well, on average, only 70% are participating. So the materials from three of the 10 of those houses is automatically going into the garbage. So 2,150 pounds of recyclables of the 7,680 7, being generated, 2,100 automatically going into the garbage because those homes don't participate. And then of those homes that are participating, they're only putting some of the recyclables that move through their home into the recycling bin. And that might be because they don't have access to glass recycling like Susan was describing earlier, or it could be that they're just not thinking about putting the glass in the recycling bin. So then only 21, uh, so there, those homes are throwing eno uh, another 2,100 pounds away. So that leaves us with a final capture rate of 3,400 pounds or only 44% of what was available in those households. Next slide. 
So let's think about that and then let's explore curbside recycling program performance and think about the, the performance of individual curbside recycling systems. Next. So when the recycling partnership works with communities and we work with communities across the country, including as Susan just described Lafayette a minute ago, we think about how do you assess how well a curbside recycling program is doing and our favorite benchmark to, to uh, assess the productivity of curbside recycling programs is by using this pounds per household served figure. And so what the way you figure that out is you take the total tons collected by a curbside recycling program and you divide that total tons collected by the number of households served and what you get is pounds per household served. So you have to convert the tons into pounds, but if you do that math, you get a, a metric called pounds per household served. And I'm gonna explore, explore this a little bit more with you. Next. So remember, uh, you've seen this slide before, uh, that the average home is generating 768 pounds per household. So a perfect curbside recycling program on average would be collecting 768 pounds Per household. Next slide. So how do you explore capture? And I like to think about capture as a percent. And I used 800 because it's easier to do math with 800 than it is with 768. But if you, if your average home generated 800 pounds of recyclables, and they put 400 of those pounds in the recycling bin, and they put 400 of those pounds in the trash can, then th that home, that system would have a 50% capture rate. In other words, it would be capturing 50% of the materials that are available. And now let's use that uh, to explore how curbside recycling programs perform. Next slide. So part of our 2020 state of curbside report involved doing a survey of lots of lots of curbside recycling programs in the country. And there are a lot of different kinds of programs. Remember, there are programs where people have automatic access. There are programs where people have to subscribe. And there's a, other mixes of curbside recycling systems in the country. If you look at the average capture of materials, all programs, all curbside recycling programs in the country are capturing on average, 440 pounds per household, 768 generated, 440 pounds captured on average. Next. And then if you start to parse that data a little more closely, you start to see which parts of the system are performing the highest. And you'll see that on average, programs that provide automatic access where people don't have to subscribe, but instead access is automatically available, they're capturing the most material. And this is the first hint at what a best management practice might look like. Next slide. So um, then if you start to look at the amount of material captured by the programs and the kinds of containers they use, that you learn something new. So, Curbside recycling happens different ways in different parts of the country. Some people recycle in bins. These are like 18 gallon barrels that are about the, side of a, about the size of a laundry basket. Some programs use plastic bags and some programs use carts. On average, if you combine all of those, you'll find that on all containers put together, um, you're seeing about a 450 pounds per household collection rate but you, you can look a little more closely and start to examine which, which uh, system type performs the highest. Go ahead, Susan. Uh, question. Do you attribute the increase in the pounds collected um, with a cart versus a bin because the cart holds more? or because do y'all find that there is more participation in programs 
that have carts as opposed to bins? That, that's a really great question. And so carts on average, the average recycling program that's using a cart is capturing 40, uh, 40, 458 or 459 pounds per household. And we think that it's actually a combination of factors. So one factor is uh, the amount of storage capacity. And so um, because recyclables are in becoming increasingly loose and um, low density, like all that plastics we were talking about earlier, that takes up a lot of space, but doesn't weigh a whole lot. And one thing we find in bin-based systems is that people recycle until their bin is full. And uh, they, if they have an 18 gallon bin, once that bin is full, um, that everything else goes into the trash until the recycling program comes and collects it. So storage capacity is an issue and the other is convenience. And um, citizens have found, programs have found and citizens tell us that carts are the most convenient way to store recyclables at their homes and move them to the street. And so I think it's those two factors, convenience and storage capacity combined that make carts so effective. So I know that there are challenges with carts in high dense areas, apartment complex and, you know, multi um, living, you know, uh, facilities. Um, and, and there's also that trend to move away from bins into carts. So how are, how are those uh, cities with high density, how are they managing carts um, uh, if there's not the, the space to store them and to have them literally on the, on the streets. Um, when we know that, that carts versus bins, carts are probably the better way to go. Really great questions. And so a couple, a couple of points, like first, the system analysis that we've done is looking at single family households and we need to do an entire separate report on the state of recycling for multifamily households. And so, Generally speaking, when communities talk about single family or curbside recycling service, they're thinking about properties with four or, five, four or five units in a building or less. And once you get more than five, the service tends to change to being dumpster based or a series of carts in a corral instead of one cart per household. But that's a really great point. And then we, we understand that carts aren't a perfect fit for every community. And there are lots of communities that will never be carted because, for instance, there's parallel parking on the street in front of everybody's house. And you can't serve a cart when there's a car, a car parked between the sidewalk and the road. Um, or when, the, when service is provided in a back alley and the alley is small, that can create an additional challenge for a cart-based collection. And what, what I would say to communities is <clears throat> don't let the fact that a part of your community is not um, cart compatible, keep you from putting carts to work in the parts of your community where carts fit. And so there might be a city with a really high density downtown and carts aren't a fit there. Um, don't take a one size fits all approach and let the carts go to work and take advantage of the benefits of carts in the part of the community where they can work. So maybe in the suburbs around the downtown, you can take advantage of carts and you might still have to use bins in the downtown or the high density areas. But don't let that stop you um, adopt what is proven to be a best management practice. And I want to keep going to kind of dig into this a little bit more. Next slide. So <clears throat> in 2016, when we published our first state of curbside recycling report, what we found, and I'm coming back to thinking about overall system performance, is that when you looked at the highest performing recycling systems in the country, those systems that were collecting at least 400 pounds per household, 83% of those systems were in carts, 93% were collecting uh, automatically, meaning uh, citizens did not have to subscribe, they were automatically given the service, 96% we're using fully commingled or single stream systems. And 100% of them had an engaged local government who was causing that system to work well. Next slide. So 
looking at bin versus carts. And the Recycling Partnership operates a grant program to help communities make the transition from bins to carts. And what you see here is data from our grant program. So on average, when we started with a community that had a bin-based program, our grantees on average were collecting 294 pounds per household in their bin-based system. And after we help them buy carts and give a cart to every household, on average, those communities were collecting 409 pounds per household. Now, this is gonna transition us into talking a little bit about contamination because lots of people think that carts, by definition, encourage more contamination. And I wanna explore that with you um, a little more deeply. But I'll say that our experience is that carts do not automatically equal increased contamination. Let's explore that. So we're gonna spend some, um, the next chunk of time talking about contamination in the recycling system. So let's, let's dig in. Uh, what does contamination looks like, look like across the country? It looks like these pictures, whether it's yard waste or bulky waste put in the materials. It might look like bagged recyclables, which create extra challenges for the MRF, but our goal is to avoid this. Next slide. So <clears throat> communities in, um, the, in the, Contamination is a big topic of discussion in the country right now. Uh, our experience um, with the state of curbside survey of more than 400 local government programs found that only 35% of those communities actually knew what their contamination rate was. So more than 65% actually didn't know what their contamination rate was and you can't manage what you don't understand. Let's explore this a little more. So let's start to look at bins versus carts and the contamination rate in bins versus carts. And so um, we, we're gonna dig in on the 35% that knew what their contamination rate was. And so that was 197 communities, 155 of them in bins, sorry, 155 in carts and 42 in bins. And the average contamination rate for that 155 carted communities was 17.67%. And the average contamination rate for the bin-based programs was 12.67%. So not a significant difference but in the contamination rate from um, between bins and carts for those communities who knew what their contamination rate was. That creates the average contamination rate in the US at 17%. And you've seen that number of 17% contamination in many of the slides that I've shared about generation rate up to now. Let's go further. When we think about contamination, really what we're trying to do is maximize the value of the materials moving through the system and minimize the cost of collecting that material. Basically, what we want is what you see in that picture, clean bales of recyclable commodities moving to marketplace. And what we don't want is the next picture. That's a plastic bale from a MRF that was doing a very poor job of managing contamination. So that's what we're trying to avoid. If you're buying plastic bottles for manufacturing um, clean recycled PET flake, you don't want to see that bale come in the door at your, at your uh, loading dock. Next slide. So let's think about contamination. In the big picture, there are really two types of contamination in the system. There's contamination on the collection side, what I like to call inbound contamination, and there's contamination on the processing side. And that's really contamination based on what's happening at the MRF. And the fact is that community recycling programs really only control the left-hand side of this equation because the right-hand side is managed by the MRF. However, what communities do can help MRFs be more effective, but in the end, it's the MRF's responsibility to clean up the material and make it um, commodity ready in the bales. Next slide. So let's look at what communities control. And they basically control um, 
They control what happens between the house and the MRF. In other words, what they put in their bin or cart and what's collected and what's delivered to the MRF. Once it's dumped at the MRF, the community control effectively ends. Um, let's talk about the role of haulers in that system. Uh, some local government programs collect recyclables with their own staff and their own trucks and others collect recyclables with um, a contracted hauler. And our experience is the intervention at the point of collection is the most effective way to control contamination. And that means that you're, if you really wanna solve contamination issues, you've gotta get the hauler involved. Next slide. The Recycling Partnership has three, we think there are three key tools for taking on contamination. And um, we activate these issues and, uh, in any program where we're working. And this is what's going on in Lafayette, where households have to get uh, information in the mail or at their home that describes what's accepted. Then um, they get personal feedback at the point of collection about whether they've prepared materials properly. And then if the system sees that there are ongoing problems, you have to touch them again with what we call a top issue mailer. Um, and you have to continue to promote um, you know, clean recycling and how to recycle right across the community through the use of other, uh, other education and outreach means. I'm gonna explore that a little further in the next slide. So to have an impact on contamination, it's going to take multiple touches and it's gonna require ongoing maintenance. Education and outreach at that community level is like owning a car. You have to keep changing the oil in a car to keep it running right. If you run a curbside or drop off recycling program, you have to keep educating on an ongoing basis in order to keep the system working properly. So it's gonna take multiple touches and communities have to budget to make those multiple touches each year. And I'm going to explore with you in a moment uh, the way you can intervene to really correct a, uh, a contamination problem. Next slide. When you're messaging um, and recycling geeks like me get really intense about thinking about materials and so many, so many recycling programs across the country do what's on the left. They start listing all the individual materials that can be in the bin and not in the bin. The average household is not going to take the time to read that list. They don't even necessarily understand what those individual materials are. And we think that the most effective way to do messaging is with a combination of images and words and using simple icons to describe what recyclables should be in the bin and what shouldn't. So when you're thinking about doing your messaging, you want to uh, use consistent, simple messaging like you see on the right hand side of the slide here. Next. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, what we call feed on the street program, which is an, an inspection regime to take on contamination. And this is what's getting launched in Lafayette. So let's explore how this works. Uh, it involves using inspectors to look at curbside recycling. And when citizens aren't preparing their recyclables properly, leaving a direct to resident piece of communication, we call it an oops tag, that gives the resident feedback at the point of collection to help them understand um, what the problem was with their recyclables. Next slide. So let's talk about the what can happen when you do this feed on the street intervention. And the Recycling Partnership has been doing a lot of work in Ohio. And I'm gonna share with you some outcomes of some interventions from three Ohioan communities that was done in 2019. So the first uh, community was Fairfield, Ohio. Just under 12,000 households. Before feet on the street, that community was experiencing a 22% contamination rate. After the Feed on the Street campaign, which ran for eight weeks in that community, eight weeks of inspection with feedback and oops tags, the 
contamination rate of the recyclables after that was 12 and a half percent. That's a 44% reduction. So it worked in Fairfield. Let's see if it worked in other places. Here's Centerville, Ohio. And at the beginning of the intervention, Centerville had a 19% contamination rate. After feet on the street, it had a 10.7% contamination rate. Next. And Akron, Ohio, the biggest community we worked with in Ohio before the intervention with feet on the street, a whopping 38, 39% contamination rate. After the intervention, the, um, the contamination rate was dropped down to 23%. So we've seen, like, if you look at the average reduction in contamination with the feet on the street intervention, you're seeing that the, that kind of intervention can reduce contamination as much as 40%. Next. So how do you do that feet on the street work? And what are the tools that are needed to do that intervention? Um, you don't need a grant to do it. You just need a computer and some resources at the community level. And these are the, this is a listing of the anti-contamination resources that the Recycling Partnership has available at no cost on our website. So um, there are two kinds of anti-contamination kits that are there for you to download right now. One that's focused on curbside recycling programs and one that's focused on drop-off recycling programs. And then there are some other tools. Uh, how do you know what your contamination rate is? Well, the um, we like to use a couple of different tools for helping assess that because the Ohio work that I shared with you involved consultants doing the actual sampling of the recyclables in, from those communities, but not everybody has access to that resource. And so what can you do instead? Uh, well, first, um, we want you to use our MRF survey tool to engage with your MRF, the processor who receives your materials, to understand exactly what should be in the bin and what shouldn't. And then separately, we want you to use our MRF tracking form <clears throat> to assess the material that you're picking up. And that is a form that the route truck driver uses at the end of their collection day when they dump the materials at the MRF to do a quick walk around of the pile of materials they just dumped and check a few boxes to help assess the contamination that was in that material. And then how do you make cart tagging work? We have a training video that's available to explain how to do that feed on the street work, that cart tagging that's available on our YouTube channel for you to see how to do it yourself. And hopefully we're gonna um, share these tools with any community in Louisiana who needs help taking on contamination. Next slide. <clears throat> so, I've spent a lot of time talking about how the curbside recycling program performs in the country and uh, thinking about how you can work specifically to take on contamination in your communities. I want to spend a few minutes running through some of the other resources that the Recycling Partnership has available on our website for, to help communities work on their recycling system. And at the same time, I want you all to be thinking about um, the questions that you might have about the information I've shared so that we can engage in uh, Q&A and discussion as after I run through these slides really quickly. So the first is that we have a grant available to help communities buy carts for their curbside recycling program. And so that this grant is available year round. Any community that's interested in buying carts um, can apply for that funding and we're the, we offer up to $15 per cart to help communities buy carts for curbside. And that money comes along with additional funding to support education and outreach and technical assistance from me and my colleagues that will help you make the most of your curbside recycling program. So whether you're implementing a new curbside recycling program or whether you're interested in converting all or a part of your community from bins to carts, this grant is available to help you. Next. We also have a greenhouse gas calculator that's available on our website. 
And if you'll remember earlier when I was talking to you about the greenhouse gas reduction potential associated with recycling, um, recycling saves a lot of energy and it saves energy on the manufacturing side. And it also reduces the emission of greenhouse gases on the disposal side, because in particular, the, the fiber products will eventually decay in the landfill and become methane. So the combined, we have a, um, recycling reduces greenhouse gas emissions, and we have a calculator that can help you figure out uh, how much greenhouse gas reductions can be produced in your community as you invest in recycling. And some communities, those kinds of sustainability metrics really help as they think about recycling and whether to invest in recycling. Next. So we also have what we call the online campaign builder. And if you remember when I was showing you the tools to fight contamination, there was the info card and the oops tag and the single issue mailer. This campaign builder helps you build those for your own community. So these are free customizable tools that are, um, you log in, you create an account and you can design um, materials very specifically for your public recycling system. Let's look at what the campaign builder can produce. That campaign, the, sorry, the campaign builder has three different outputs and these look to your citizens like they came from your program. It helps you produce an info card which highlights the acceptable materials and what shouldn't be recycled. And it uses those icons and images that I was talking about as best management practices. It helps you create a oops tag that can be customized to your top contaminants. Whatever your MRF tells you they're having the big, biggest problem with, you can highlight those issues on the oops tag. And then it also helps you create what we call a top issue mailer. And when we work with communities across the country, we see that bagged materials and plastic bags are one of the single biggest problems in the recycling system. And so we highlight the top issue mailer about bags and bagged materials. However, if your MRF tells you that their biggest challenge is tanglers, then you can do a top issue mailer about tanglers. This is a really powerful tool and I hope you'll check it out. Next slide. We also have what we call DIY signs for recycling. And this is to produce signs for your recycling system. And again, a free tool to produce a sign, whether it's for containers in your office building, containers for your carts, a sign for your cart, sorry, or a sign for a recycling bin in a public space or a drop off. This is free open source material that you can build yourself. You customize it and you download printer ready artwork that you can take to build a, um, take to a, a, a sign shop and create signs or adhesive labels to use in your program. Next. We also have social media kits that are available for communities to use. Uh, so we have a newly released COVID-19 recycling social media kit that focuses on the unique challenges created for the recycling system by uh, the coronavirus, but um, we also have other social media kits that are uh, full of posts that are ready for you to use. Basically grab and go. Um, and all you have to do is like, you uh, look through our library of posts, pick the ones that you want. You can customize them for your own use and push them out into your community via Facebook or Twitter. So take advantage of this tool and we, help, we think that um, by promoting recycling on social media, your education and outreach efforts will go further. Next. So we also have a closed face, Facebook group. And this group is specifically for local government professionals that are working on recycling issues in their communities. And um, Susan, your KAB affiliates can also participate in this group. So. Uh, it's not for the general public, it's for recycling coordinators to share resources and tips with one another. Go ahead. No, I'm just uh, here to say we have 15 more minutes left and I know you are approaching the end of your presentation and we have 
quite a few questions that we will wrap it up with. So I'm just kind of giving you a, a little heads up on our time, Rob. Fantastic, Thank Susan. Thanks. And I appreciate everybody's patience with me as I've got so much information I want to share with you. Just a few more slides and then we'll get to the discussion. So next, uh, the other thing that, uh, remember pounds per household served? So many communities in the country don't have the ability to assess their, pro their program performance. And because we found that that's a shortcoming, we've produced what we call the Municipal Measurement Program. And we partnered with Emerge Knowledge to make the Municipal Measurement Program or MMP system available for free that, so communities across the country can en enroll in this um, web-based tracking system and plug in the metrics about your program. And you can use that to get reports about the, the performance of your recycling system. Reports like on the next slide. So you can get a summary of your program um, performance. You can look at the economic benefits of recycling. You can, um, if you have enough data, you can assess your diversion rate, your um, pounds per household collected, and you can benchmark yourself against those national averages that I was sharing with you. So this is a really powerful tool Again, free for any community in the country to sign up for. Next slide. So another tool we have is a MRF contracting guide. This is a, um, this is a resource uh, recently published to help communities engage with the materials recovery facility to um, build a contract, an effective contract between the community and their processor. <clears throat> we understand that the relationship between the MRF and the community recycling system is critical for success of recycling in the US. And so many communities were falling short on how their contracts looked. And so the guide offers an overview of the contracting process, walks you through step-by-step -step how to prepare, and it includes details about the 11 essential elements that we think every MRF contract in the country should include and as well as sample language and key tips. So if you're, um, if you're contracting with a MRF or thinking about contracting with a MRF, we hope you'll look this guide up. And um, to kind of close, because I've painted the picture of some serious challenges with recycling and the underperforming system um, and a system that's stressed resource wise, but I wanna close by reminding everybody that there's an intense amount of public support for recycling and that what we need to do as program operators is tap into that support. So um, if you look at the percentage of Americans, and this is from some national survey work that we did last fall, sorry, last spring, we found that 84% of the country feels that recycling is a valuable public service, equally as valuable as waste collection and, and as water and sewer. So your public supports recycling and not only do they support it, the, a, a significant number of Americans across the country are willing to pay more, um, pay more taxes to have a better recycling program. So if you look, um, look at the uh, st stats that I'm sharing with you. So 35% of the country said they'd be willing to pay 40 to $50 more per year um, to have a better recycling program. 11% said they would be willing to pay as much as $500 a year more. 25% said they would be willing to pay at least $100 per year more in their taxes to have a better recycling system. So as you're thinking about whether to invest in recycling in your community, you need to tap into that support. Um, so I think, Susan, we're at the point where I'm ready to dig in on the questions and to explore the things that folks have thought about while I've been talking. Thank you so much for your time. Great. Rob, this has been fantastic. Uh, so much information. Um, I almost don't even know where to start. Um, but I'm going to backtrack a little bit because we asked two questions at the beginning of the presentation, and I promised you I would tell you what that was, and I didn't. And so... Um, 53% of the people that are attending this webinar have curbside recycling offered to them and 
are participating. Now, I know we already have an engaged audience because they are here with us today, but I think what that shows is that if you offer it, you know, people will use it. Um, so a couple of things, like I said, I'm not sure. I, I'm gonna try not to be all over the board here. We have about uh, seven minutes. So I think one of the things that we um, struggle with the most here in Louisiana is our, our lack of infrastructure. We have one main MRF that's located in Baton Rouge. Unfortunately, we had one in Northern Louisiana that uh, recently closed. And then we have one in the Jefferson Parish area that was built for Jefferson Parish. We're hoping that they might be able to expand in the, in the future. Um, and so that, that poses a tremendous amount of challenges for any type of recycling um, for Louisiana. Um, and we also have an overabundance of landfills. So it's very inexpensive to bring things to the landfill as opposed to bringing it to a MRF traveling additional um, distance, which is ex you know it's expensive, it's labor, it's manpower, it's truck, it's gas, all of those things involved. And so, um, in addition to that challenge, we also have the challenge of, um, in order for us to really have a handle on our baseline of contamination and to be able to use some of these tools that you outlined today, um, getting that baseline, as you mentioned, requires help and, and participation from the MRF as well. So can you talk a little bit about if we don't have that participation um, or if everything is going to one MRF and, and it's commingled and um, what are other communities, how have they overcome that or resolved that if faced with the same situation we have here in Louisiana? Isn't that like, probably we should book another hour um, to go through that uh, question. And, you know, I, I acknowledge the challenges to, um, that are there to make recycling work in Louisiana. And yet your audience is um, a, the perfect example of the fact that people in, the, in your state are deeply engaged and want recycling to work as well. <clears throat> so uh, several um, things to thoughts based on what you've said. First is we have to continue to tap in to that citizen interest in recycling. And I know that communities have lots of strain placed on them, but um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's gonna take a public investment to make recycling work better. And your leaders have to hear that the public wants to make that investment. And at the same time, we, um, the Recycling Partnership has heard that communities um, can't do this alone. And that's why we're pulling together the resources that we are, the grant funding that we have, and we're working on some policy solutions as well that we hope will deliver additional resources to support those communities. And we have not talked at all about policy, but um, I want folks to look at the Recycling Partnerships uh, Accelerating Recycling Policy Report that helps outline some of the strategies we think are um, available uh, to grow recycling in the U.S. Now, taking a step back, recycling is an, is an economy of scale operation. And the more that uh, folks recycle and the more recyclables you have, it drives down system cost. And this is a challenge in, 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 across the country, but I want, I want to challenge your communities to think about how they can work together to grow recycling infrastructure. So for instance, think about the communities around New Orleans. Uh, no one of those communities alone has enough material uh, in its control to justify building a MRF um, or attracting uh, like a highly modernized MRF operator. But collectively, if they're willing to band together uh, and say, We're, we would commit our tons collectively to a single processor, if somebody would build a modern MRF for us, you have the power to draw in and create a recycling option for yourselves. And you can tap the resources in our, um, our MRF contracting guide to figure out how to build that 
collective, but it takes communities working together and it takes stakeholders like, like your organization, Susan, to convene those communities to think about how they can work together to take this on. Yeah, and it's it's the you know is there is there the political will for this as well? And so we find that there's a big disconnect. You you mentioned about the 84 percent people who you know say they support recycling. Um, we find that there's a, a lot of people that you know will say they support it but don't want to pay for it. And then you have the elected officials who don't want to impose an increase in the the solid waste you know fees in order to offer you know uh, curbside recycling because um, you know they they fear that that's not going to they want they don't want to increase fees and, and have you know financial burden on their residents um, and so the, we don't have enough of that political will and the and and really the leadership needed to to um, to bring curbside recycling to Louisiana in a big way. I love the, um, the, the MRF guidelines and I am going to um, suggest that all of our municipalities and our parishes get, at, get their hands on that and we'll make sure that they do because I think you're right, it starts there with the contract because you can't hold the MRFs accountable if it's not in the contract. And so I think that's a fabulous, fabulous tool that y'all have that we will, um, I'd like to talk to you more about that and how we can help get that in the hands of the Municipal Association, the Police Jury Association and those, those kinds of folks. Um, so let's see, I think we might have another question. Um, okay, so I think that might be, uh, about it, I do want to mention a few things. Um, so, Rob, do you have any last minute questions before I, I close us out or any last minute comments? Yeah, just one last thing that, um, you know, the recycling partnership is on a mission and a journey. And we're on that journey with Keep Louisiana Beautiful, with all the folks on the call, the communities across the country and those stakeholders. So I'm gonna go back to the slide I started with the uh, listed all the companies that are supporting the recycling partnership. And well, we're having hard discussions with our funders about if um, what they can do to help the recycling system work better because community resources are so constrained and because the system is built on the backs of communities right now. and. I think that it, we're going to continue to see solutions being delivered over the next five to 10 years that are going to help communities have more resources um, because it, we're all in this together. And those companies um, understand that for recycling to work, they need to step up further. And so uh, it, and the, their support of the partnership is a, like a powerful first step. And I think that we're going to keep getting uh, stronger together. Yes. Thank you very much, Rob. And I, I want to uh, bring up a slide for those of y'all who are interested in learning more about this. Um, contamination is a piece to the puzzle. It's clearly um, not, you know, in itself, it's not the solution. And so, the EPA released a national recycling strategy. And um, it is, uh, if you look at this third bullet point, um, you can go to that website. And if y'all wanna pull out y'all phones and take a, a, a picture of this so that y'all can follow up on that, please do so now. So they have pulled together a national strategy um, and it really focuses on three main things. The first objective is to reduce contamination in the recycling stream. And the second is to increase processing efficiency. And the third is to improve markets. And so I'm really excited about this. Um, they have it open now until December 4th for public comment. So be a voice, be an advocate, get involved, take a look at this and let them, let them know your thoughts and your feedback on that. The other thing I wanted to, to mention is that EPA Region 6 has a recycling town hall meeting um, 
today. It's at one o'clock to, to 2.30 and you can register by going to that website. And then I also wanted to mention that the Louisiana Recycling Coalition will be hosting a webinar. And this is an introduction to government recycling demands on champion program. And it talks about purchasing and how they can make changes, changes in their purchasing to reduce waste. And this will be held on December 2nd at 10 o'clock. And this is where you can go to register. If you check back in a few days, it will also be, there'll be a link on their website. Uh, and that is the Recycle, Louisiana Recycling Coalition. I also wanted to follow up on one of Rob's uh, comments about us all working together. How will we move the needle when it comes to recycling, whether it's reducing contamination, increasing participation, um, improving the markets, um, and it's, it is about working together. And several years ago, we started the Louisiana Recycling Coalition with a group of um, folks just like you and I who are just interested in bringing together um, um, and, and, and improving recycling in Louisiana. So I encourage you to go to that website and to join up, not just to be a member, but to be actively involved in supporting um, these initiatives. That is one way that if, if recycling is near and dear to your heart and you're frustrated by it, like we all are, um, let's take action and let's work together to, to change things in Louisiana. Our recycling rate is around 6% um, and we, we, we can do better. We need to do better. Um, so with that being said, thank you, Rob. We appreciate your presentation. I think we've learned quite a bit today. Um, I hope our attendees also uh, enjoyed the presentation. So I wanted to, before we go, remind you that we have one more session left and that is November 24th and it is at nine o'clock. And again, it is on um, how we can uh, improve enforcement of the litter laws in Louisiana. So please join us at that time. And for now, we're gonna go ahead and say goodbye and thank you for joining us and have a beautiful day. Take care. <laughs>